Hi, sir. You sound pretty distant. Put on your headphone. Put on your headphone. Sir, put on your oh, head. You sound very soft. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> For the second time, I forgot that uh, got to put the headset on for the mic to work. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. All right. How about now? Is this is it better now? Yes, much better. Okay, great. Then uh, let's take it from here. So, um, so this is the second uh part of our discussion of how courts analyze whether the duty of care was breached and you know on monday we discussed the uh risk factor analysis that uh is undertaken to determine whether the required actions were reasonable to ask for okay um but there are a uh, a couple of of other issues that we're going to um, to deal with, right? And those are special cases where the analysis changes a little bit. Okay, specifically, we're going to be talking about omissions, and we're going to talk about race ipsa loquitur. Okay, and if if Race ipsa loquitur doesn't make any sense to you. That's fine. That's why we're here. We're going at the end of the class. Hopefully, it will make more sense. So normally, right? Normally, the duty of care is seen as a duty to act, right? So if you have a duty of care, there is something that you are required to do. Um, under certain uh, particular circumstances, right, there can be a duty to refrain from acting. Okay, so there's a so you're doing something and you shouldn't have, right? You should have just skipped out on that. Um, the problem that you run into when you're studying, if if you are reading. The textbook is that the textbook talks about this concept of the uh, the duty to refrain from acting and says, okay, this isn't really a thing in most cases. Um, and then it immediately goes into discussing the failure to act, right? So what these are, are these are cases where the court and, and you may be confused about how these fit together. What these are, are these are cases where the court found that there was no duty. Okay, there was no duty. And so whether you acted or refrained from acted, there can be no breach. Okay. So let's let's look at does does this make sense as a concept? We're going to talk about some examples in a second. But what what questions do you have about this as a concept? No questions? No, everything's good. We can. Okay, uh, then we will we will continue. And and again, we're going to be talking about examples. And so, if after the examples you're still confused, that may give you some hooks into into discussing this. But what happens is this: is it matters how the court construes the accident. Right, so if there's 
if the accident is construed as some sort of act of commission, okay, I do something that causes the accident, then there's a much stronger argument for liability than if I failed to do something and that failure to act caused the accident. Okay, so let me give you a very silly example, right? The defendant in a car accident case is not going to be able to argue that he can escape liability because all he did was fail to apply the brakes. Okay, that, that's not going to fly. All right. Why not? Because he ought, to, he, ought to, he ought to apply the bricks. That is standard. Colette, what were you, was, was that more or less what you were going to say? No, I was saying that is a strict liability um, case. Well, um, you know, we're not discussing strict liability at, at this point, right? This is still, a, we're still in the realm of negligence. So Rudolph, I think, is on the right track, right? When he says, you know, look, you had a duty to apply the brakes, right? The specific duty of care that applies to a driver includes the duty to uh, use the mechanics of the, the automobile, including the brakes, in order to avoid accidents, right? You're not... You're not allowed to go. Well, I was, I was, uh, I was engaged in pressing down the accelerator, but that didn't cause the accident. The lack of braking caused the accident, right? Um, and so, those are that's that's the difference in commission and omission. In a very silly example, okay. But let's talk about an example that I think is a little bit harder, right? Let's say that we have a couple uh, and they are, let's call them Alice and Bob, okay? Just two handy dandy names. They don't mean anything. Um, Let's say that Alice and Bob are at Alice's apartment. They're having a fight and they're loud enough that the neighbors can hear them through the walls. And so the neighbors call down to the private security that the apartment complex provides. Okay. A couple of Security officers go to the apartment and they knock on the door. Alice says, oh, thank God you're here. He's going to kill me. Security guards pull Bob aside, say, hey, probably uh, need to go home. Certainly don't do anything rash. You should be careful, blah, 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 blah. They leave. I think you know where the, the punchline of the story is. Um, can we hold the private security, uh, either the officers or the company or the apartment complex liable for failing to remove Bob from Alice's apartment? Let's hear from someone else, Rudolph. I, don't, I, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but I want to make sure that, uh, that everybody in the class is involved in participating. So let's, let's hear from someone else. Go ahead. Go ahead, Tammy. Um, he will be liable because... Um, 
They said have no general duty to act positively for the benefit of others. So I don't think they, should, they would be like. So there's not there's not a general duty, right? Was there is there a specific duty under these facts, though? Anybody? Go ahead, Tia. Maybe there is a specific duty because um, the security guards are there to protect the complex from. And that just, like, sir, I just I can't hear Tia. Um, I know she can talk a bit louder. Can I, I can't hear her at all. Yeah, it. I wasn't going to say anything because I could make you. I could barely make you out. But yeah, if you can get the mic closer to your mouth, that would be helpful. Go ahead, Tia. Um, I was saying, um, the securities would have probably a special duty to the people at the complex because they are there to protect them from anything. So, so. The argument, right, that Tia is making is that the uh, apartment complex or the security company or whomever, right, whomever the appropriate uh, defendant is, has undertaken this duty to provide security, right, that, that maybe they don't have as a matter of course, but they have, they've, they've assumed this duty because of the circumstances of the relationship. And I think that's similar to, to the comment that Joy is making in, uh, in the chat. Um, and Keandre points out that there absolutely can be a statutory duty imposed, right? We talked about that last week with the, um, with the birth defects uh, case where there's absolutely no common law duty owed to someone who doesn't exist, right? Um, but the statute has created this duty, right? Parliament has undertaken to create this duty. So Keandre is absolutely right that there could be a statutory duty in place. Um, does your answer change? Does your answer change if instead of the uh, private security provided by the the apartment complex or the the housing complex. Um, what if the neighbors called the police? So, do the police owe the duty to act under these facts? I believe in those circumstances, sir. They do. I mean, I I will be honest with you. Where I come from, they do not. Um, but. Yeah. But I am I am open to being to to being told that in the Caribbean that is not the case that the the police take uh, have a duty to act um, in under those circumstances. Yes. I, what I heard was that um, the neighbors called the police. The police came and she said, "Thank thank God you're here. He was going to kill me." And mm -hmm. then I didn't hear much else after that. Now. It seems to me, now this is a relationship between two people. She might've said that when they first arrived and depending on the situation, she might've said, oh, well, you know, they might've made up if I want to put it that way um, before the police left and the police could have left them, left them there. You know what I mean? Left the gentleman there and not removed him from the premises. Cause I think you were asking if the police, if the security guards had a duty to remove the individual from the premises. It is possible that you know how, the, how these relationship things go. One day they're arguing, next day, the next minute they're fine. I mean, it is a possibility. I, it might not be as simple as, you know, do they have a duty to remove the person? But what happened during the course when they were there? She might've said, oh, he want to kill me. And then, you know, by the time, because you didn't say much else after in your story. So, but, so, so Derek, your sound keeps cutting out. Um, but I think I have an impression of what you what you said. What it's as I understand uh, Derek's point, and he can pipe up in the chat to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but as I understand his point, his point is that it is entirely possible that sort of buried in these facts is this uh, circumstance that we're aware of, where. Um, 
police responding to a domestic disturbance actually cause the participants in the domestic disturbance to put on a face, right? And to, to pretend that everything's, everything's fine. <clears throat> Joy, that's more, that's more or less how I understand Derek's question as well. So um, I'm sorry, I, there's, uh, go ahead, Sasha. Go ahead, yeah. Sasha. No, I was thinking with regards to the, um, the responsibility of the guards, security guards, uh, does it depend on their contractual duty and, and, and what their work entails? Are they hired to protect the property or are they hired to deal with domestic issues? Because what do they all depend on what their contractual duty, what their job entails? Would not determine if they had a duty to respond to, to the individuals in a situation like that? I think that absolutely is a reasonable thing to ask, right? Is what, you know, are the security guards there to protect the property or are they there to protect the residents? And I think that, you know, certainly if they're there to protect the residents, then that, that invokes something that perhaps to, uh, gives rise to a, um, to a duty to act. Uh, but in the event of their, you know, they're strictly there to protect the property, um, then I think that's a harder question, right? Uh, I think you can still make an argument, but uh, for, for a duty to act, but I think it's harder, right? Okay. So um, when you said, when you said that we know how the punchline goes, did you mean that he actually killed her or they just pretended that everything yes. was okay? That's what the, you meant, the, right? Yes. Right. Yes. So, um, so, yeah, go ahead. Um, in, the case, in the case where the lady was asking for help because she feared for her life and the security guards were there to protect the lives of the persons living in this apartment complex and they feared their life as well, would they, can they refrain from acting or? Um, Sorry, could she ask that question again? So, so my understanding of the question, and and Tamara, you can you can correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding of the question is, given these assumptions, the role of the security guards is to protect residents, not property. Um, and in the event that you have a jurisdiction like the one I'm from where the police have no duty to act, do these private security guards have a duty to act? Did, Tamara, is that, was that your question? Yes, please. Okay. The answer to your question is that my understanding of of the doctrine, and again, this is predicated on the assumption that the police do not have a, an independent duty, okay? Um, my understanding of the doctrine is that uh, security guards whose job description includes the protection of people have a duty to act and, and their employers can be held liable in, under these facts. Security guards whose job description is the protection of property do not have a duty to act. Okay. Uh, sir. Yes, go ahead, Sally Ann. Um, even in a case where you may have a duty to protect the property, if, like, say, in the domestic uh, um, situation, where the security guard reasonably believe that that would result in destruction of property, wouldn't they have a responsibility or a duty to remove the person then? Um, so the answer is going to turn on whose property. So if Bob is just gonna smash up Alice's stuff, then the security guards don't owe a duty to Alice, right? Their job is protecting the complex's property. 
but if yeah. it's gonna break the door or the window, depending on the level of violence being used, then they would have reasonable um, responsibility to remove the person. Agreed. I, I agree with that. This gets into the question of uh, remoteness and foreseeability that we're gonna talk about in a couple of weeks. But the short answer to your question is, under those facts, as you're describing them, they would owe a duty to remove Bob, but that duty would not be owed to Alice and they would owe no, and there would be no liability to Alice or her estate um, for failing to remove Bob. The, the duty would be owed to the employer and the liability would be to the employer for, for failing to remove Bob if he breaks up the, the apartment. So um, HOAs are not, there's no, no HOA involved in this process. This isn't, this isn't that, uh, that kind of fact pattern. So we're, we're, so this is, so, so this is, I think, you know, you're starting to see the difficulty of um, the duty related to a failure to act. Okay. Um, one last, one last question in this, and then we're going to move on. Let's say that it's not security at all, right? Let's say that the fight is one that, you know, the neighbors don't know, don't notice for whatever reason, doesn't matter what the reason is, the neighbors don't notice it. But Alice's roommate is in the apartment and Alice's roommate hears what's going on. Alice says, help me get rid of him. And the roommate says, no, I'm scared, I'm leaving, and leaves. Is the roommate liable for failing to remove Bob? I don't think so. It's not similar to like when, the, when we had our first lecture, you were saying that if um, like you see somebody kill somebody on the street and you're walking past them, then you don't have a, you don't have the right to do anything. Um, in that you don't have the you don't have the duty. The duty, right? Sorry, you don't have the duty to do anything. Isn't that similar to that? That's, I mean, I think that's that is essentially correct. Mystique asks, would that be a special relationship? Um, the answer to that is, I. I mean, it is not impossible for that to be correct. I know of no case that has held that a roommate owes a special duty to, uh, to, to act to prevent harm uh, under these circumstances, okay? Um, in, in fact, right, uh, Mystique says that there's no good neighbor principle, in fact, there are places uh, um, where stopping to help someone can create liability. So um, you, you pass a, a car accident by the side of the road and emergency uh, personnel have not shown up and you uh, stop and you're trying to help the, the person uh, who's been in the car wreck and they, they get harmed, you can be sued for that, right? So, um, yep, there, this is, um, there are specific statutes that actually insulate you from liability under those circumstances because of the court decisions that that said nope you you acted where you where you had no duty to act and so having done that you had you had a duty not to harm them and you did and so there you go right um, um so 
Yes, go ahead. That they tried to resuscitate the person and the person ended up dying because of what they did. That is absolutely, these are absolutely, those are absolutely the kinds of things that we're talking about, right? And we're talking, and things like, um, uh, I mean, even things like uh, if you um, see a car on fire, right? And you are, un you stop to help and you are unable to rescue the person who is in the car, you could be held liable under, under these doctrines, right? So you see why, why they call them good Samaritan statutes for, I think, obvious reasons. Um, but you see why those statutes sort of play an important role in those jurisdictions, right? That, um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, not to interrupt you, but is is there, if you stop to help somebody who's in a car that's on fire and you fail to help them, either way, whether the person has died, so I don't understand how um, how you can be held liable. It's not that like you caused the fire. Yeah, the the logic is basically by stopping to help, you assumed a duty to to do to to. Um, take the reasonable actions to save their lives, right? And um, by failing to do so, right, if there was something that you could have done but didn't, right? So for example, um, so I, I'll give you an example from, um, this is actually a, a, a story, um, this, there's no rescuer involved in the real life story, but the, the facts that I'm giving you actually happened to, um, to uh, a friend of my brother's. So this is, this is a real situation. Um, you uh, are in a car accident, the car catches on fire, you're, you're unable to unfasten your seatbelt. And by the way, this is not an argument for not wearing your seatbelt. Um, but uh, rescuer comes along and fails to rescue you. You burn to death. Your estate uh, says, Mr. Rescuer, you should have kept a box cutter in your car so that you could cut the seatbelt and, and save them. Court says, yeah, that seems like a reasonable thing to ask of you. If you're going to attempt to rescue people from burning cars, it is reasonable to require you to carry a box cutter so that, so that you can cut the seatbelt and pull them out. That's, that's the logic, okay? The, the logic is if, uh, Keandre is exactly right. If you wanna be a superhero, bring your tools. Okay. Um, Ray, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah, so that might be the logic, but then it's not logical because in some instances, if um, who really brings these claims against the person who tries to rescue someone in, at the end of the day? <laughs> like... I mean, the answer, the answer to that is uh, if you... You know, the story of how disputes become lawsuits um, is a very complicated one. There's lots of steps involved. And certainly, you know, certainly we can look at this particular type of case and go, something seriously has gone wrong in this society for this to be a thing that happens. Um, but it's a thing that happens and you know the response to to those to these behaviors is to engage in in uh, legislating to to insulate people from those from those kinds of lawsuits joy go ahead the comment i wanted to make is that i imagine that at some point um somebody may have stopped to help and tried to help and done more harm than good um and i imagine that yeah i imagine Certainly. that that's probably how some of these disputes are have arisen 
and how you know the law has developed in that regard like Maybe there's think, some minimum standard for if you're gonna offer to help. Like if and you I think, can't write, and I think, don't try to help me. Yeah, and I think that's I think that's more or less the logic that the courts were trying to to impose was um and I, I think I think Keandre uh put it very succinctly and put it very well. If you wanna be a superhero, better bring the tools, right? So um what Kesran asks, what if the person asked for help? So I think that's a different uh, that's a different fact pattern, right? Because we're all, you know, all of these are cases where you sort of come upon the situation, but it's certainly similar to the the domestic disturbance case that we talked about, right? That you know, you're asking for help, and does that impose a duty to act? Not you know, and the answer is not generally, right? So Michael, your hand is raised, go ahead. All right, so let's say that the that the purpose, like Joy said, was to stop people from coming and helping and causing more harm than good. If we go back to the, the circumstance where you have the person inside the car who tried to help but didn't, and the person still ended up dying anyway, in that, sir, in that instance, if you use statutory interpretation using the um, mischief rule, did it actually cause more harm than good? The, the outcome was the same. What would happen in a, um, in a circumstance like that? I'm sorry, my, uh, my, the, the, I have a, a US phone number that connects to my computer and it started ringing. So I'm gonna need, I need you to, to say that again. I'm very sorry. I was, okay. Uh, let's use the um, the circumstance that Joy said just now, where um, let's say the laws are put in place to stop people from helping and causing more harm than good. Well, it's not really helping, but you get the point. And uh, let's say, for instance, we use the same car that caught a fire, the person who tried to help them but did not help them, and they still ended up dying. The outcome would have been the same, nevertheless. So if you're interpreting that and using the mischief rule, if the outcome was still the same, what would happen in a case like that? Yeah, so I think that that raises issues of causation, right? They don't, it doesn't, you know, we're, we're presuming the duty to act, we're presuming the duty to act reasonably, and then under your facts, the, the place where things sort of break down is on the causation step. And that's gonna be what we talk about next week. Okay, Ariel, you get the last word on this and then we, we do have to move on because we have to talk about race ipsa. Okay, this is actually, uh, was a quick question from the roommate and it's like a whole different situation, right? So if the roommate happened to bring like a boyfriend or a husband or a brother into the room and he attacked, like, let's say I'm the roommate, he attacked me and I was hurt. Did she now have a duty of care to like stop him from attacking me? Or would it still be a situation of, you know, good Samaritan and she didn't have to help? Yeah, that's a tough question. You know, I think um, I think that different jurisdictions may take different approaches to that. Because uh, I think that there's definitely room to say, you know, look, you brought this, you know, this dangerous person into the home. And so you have a duty to protect uh, the home's occupants from the dangerous person, um, but the other the other piece of that is, you know, I didn't know he was going to attack you. I didn't know that this was going to happen. I, you know, how could I have known what, you know, the, his choice to attack you is not imputable to me, right? And I think there, I think both of those are reasonable arguments, and I think I could very easily see jurisdictions coming down on both sides of that question. Okay, and, and I, I don't have a better answer for you, I'm afraid. Um, so now let's talk about race ipsa, right? So race ipsa loquitur, and let me put that phrase in the chat for you so that you have it. Race ipsa loquitur, one of the uh, many Latinisms that you pick up as you continue your legal training. This one means the thing speaks for itself, okay? 
So uh, you'll, you know, the, um, you'll remember from criminal law, the mens rea and the actus rea, the word rea in those terms is the same root as race. They both mean thing, right? Um, and ipsa is ipso facto, right? So the thing is, uh, so it is um, the, the fact for itself, right? And loquitur, of course, comes from the same root, but root is loquacious. And so it, it refers to speaking, okay? And circumlocution and elocution, all of these are the same root. So the thing speaks for itself. What it means is this is a doctrine where the facts are such that we have to conclude that negligence happened, okay? And what this does is this is a burden shifting doctrine, okay? So you guys recall, we talked about um, the burden of proof and we, uh, we talked about how plaintiffs have the burden of proof in tort cases, and it's a burden of proof on the balance of probabilities. If you successfully invoke race ipsa as a, as a plaintiff, you now put the burden on the defendant. You have demonstrated that negligence happened, and the defendant now has the burden to come back and say, well, actually, we behaved reasonably. Okay, and the, the way that race ipsa works is that you, you can't specifically point to the negligent action, all right? The circumstances are such that you don't know as the plaintiff what happened, but you know that something happened. How do we know that something happened? That's, that's the part that gets where uh, race ipsa gets hairy. Okay, how do we know that negligence happened? We know it by proving two things. The first one is control of the activity by the defendant or their agents. Okay, control of the activity by the defendant or their agents. Okay. This is a fairly simple and straightforward question, right? We know sort of who's under control at any given point. The second thing that we have to talk, that, that you have to prove in order to invoke race ipsa is you have to prove that the accident that happened doesn't happen when you, under normal operation of the activity, okay? So let's talk about these in turn, right? First, let's talk about control. So how do we define who controls an activity, right? So let me, let me put it this way, all right? When I moved here from Barbados and uh, my household in the United States was packed up and, and shipped down here and brought to my house and unpacked, um, there were some glass items that had been that had broken at some point in the process. So who had control of my move for the purpose of race ipsa? Is it the movers that I hired? Is it the uh, the moving company? Is it the crew of movers that they hired to come and pack up my stuff in the United States? Is it the shipping company that transported it from the port of Mobile, Alabama to Bridgetown? Is it the customs broker? Is it the, bar, is it the Bajan moving crew, right? So these are five different entities, five different persons that are involved in my move. Who controls the move for the, the purposes of race ipsa? Rudolph says the owner. Who do you mean by the owner? All right. It is your, is your um, primary responsibility in the first instance to ensure that your, your goods are well, um, let's say, secured. So you will, take, you will take the responsibility to ensure that they're well packed and that the persons to whom 
you you ensure you're placing them in their care and got to look after them. I, I, I'm beginning to understand your point because you, your responsibility is limited in that you can only uh, do so much because like you said earlier, when you mean these other five people, you are not really in control of what they're doing. So I, I really am getting your point now. At so, first I was uh, you, but I'm now picking you up. It's not necessarily you in all five instances. So join you know, uh, Joy and Lucy, you don't you don't agree. Go ahead. Okay, so my thinking is you would have hired the the first mover and ensuring obviously you would have understood the meeting agreement that they would have taken care or packed the the products, the um your your materials in such a way that it would protect them from from any harm. So based on that, they would have put the necessary wording on the boxes stating that these ones must be handled within a certain way. Now, if that occur at that level and they did that part, then the next, um, the next group that would have been handling it had a responsibility to adhere to the fact that notice was placed on the boxes. I, so that so I, I don't think from there, yeah, I don't mean to I don't mean to cut you off, but we're we are running out of time. We've got a little more to cover, and so I want to to um, I want to make sure that that we get through everything. Um, but yes, you are absolutely right that like this is a situation where there's a transfer of responsibility through the process. Now, the practical answer, right? Just to sort of wrap this up, the practical answer is the person who's responsible for this is the insurance company. <laughs> because my agreement with the moving company that I hired who sort of set all of this in motion said that the the only compensation was through the, the insurance that they offered. So yes, Shaveen's absolutely right. The, insur the insurer is ultimately the responsible party. <laughs> but let's talk about the second element because this is the one that's really hard. This is the this is one of those places, the second element of res ipsa loquitur, where there's an ex, there's some uh, element of I know it when I see it. Okay, and so let me let me explain what I mean. The second element of Lynn, you came off mute. Do you did you have something you wanted to say? Okay, no, it was a mistake. All right, no no big deal. Um, the uh, the second element says that race ipsa applies if the accident is one that does not happen during normal responsible operation of the activity. So here is the example that I think illustrates this very nicely. It is normal and reasonable and sometimes it just happens that you rear end the car in front of you on the road, right? That can happen even where there's no negligence, okay? Conditions can just be right and it, it just happens. Um, it is impossible in the absence of some sort of tortious conduct, right? Negligence or whatever, um, for your car to jump the curb and run over a pedestrian, right? So, so, If we have a car accident where you rear-ended somebody, right, and you're, you know, two cars on the road and, and you bump into the, into the rear end of the car in front of you, race ips is not going to apply to that. You're going to have to show some sort of specific uh, breach of the duty of care. If somebody's driving their car and they drive onto the sidewalk and they run you over as you're walking down the sidewalk, okay, race ipsa probably applies in that case. Um, so I, I'll tell you this story and then we'll, we'll move on. Um, we'll, we'll call it a day. Uh, when I took torts, when I was in law school, uh, the case, um, so, so I have a private message, right? The car sliding when it's snowing and you can't stop it, right? So this is an absolute situation where the, defendant 
would be able to rebut the presumption of negligence. So race ipsa creates a rebuttable presumption, which means that now the defendant has to show that they weren't negligent. But if they do, they win, right? And so in, those, in that case where the car is sliding through snow or through black ice, right, being the, the greater danger in cold weather conditions, um, then that's a situation where race ipsa might come into play, but the defendant would be able to rebut the presumption and still, still prevail. So this is the story that I'll, I'll close on. When I was taking torts in law school, um, the case that we used to uh, learn race ipsa was a case involving um, a church bell. And the church bell had uh, struck someone in the street. Uh, it had been rolling down, down a hill in the street, ran somebody over. And the court observed that the normal operation of church bells did not include road trips. And so from that, they inferred that someone had been negligent at some point. Um, so that was, uh, that was how race ipsa was explained, was taught to me. Um, I think that's a really useful, evocative uh, uh, case to sort of give us a view of like how this, this doctrine works, okay? So what questions do you guys have about uh, the omissions as a breach of duty and the res ipsa loquitur? Okay, so I have a question in, in private, can we repeat the second element? Um, the second element in race ipsa is the way that it's phrased in the book, is that the accident was one that could not occur absent negligence on the part of the defendant or their, I'm sorry, I sent that as a private message. Um, The accident was one that could not occur absent negligence on the part of the defendant or their servants. So the way that I phrased that for you guys is um, the accident does not occur in the normal operation of the activity. Okay. So um, there's a question about tutorials this week. Uh, the tutorial questions are on e-learning. Um, uh, Michael asks, please repeat the first element. The first element is the element of control. Okay, so the way the book phrases it is that control of the activity or object is in the hands of the defendant or their servants. Okay, Tamar asks, would race ipsa be similar to prima facie? So race ipsa is a prima facie doctrine, right? If you invoke res ipsa, you have created the prima facie case of negligence. And the burden now shifts to the defendant to rebut that prima facie case, okay? So prima facie just means that you have created the rebuttable presumption. And it, it applies sort of to all types of cases where the plaintiff bears the burden um, and once they, once they meet that standard, the burden shifts to the defendant to either uh, rebut the prima facie case or prove some sort of affirmative defense. Okay, so what other questions are there as we wrap up? Any last questions? Last chance, going once. Going twice. Okay, so we're going to call it a day, um, and I uh, I appreciate 
you guys being here with me and, and working through this. This has been really great. And uh, we'll see you guys, those of you that have tutorials, uh, we'll see you later this week and everybody else, we'll see you on Monday. So take care and bye.